welcome to Palm Sunday Worship at Trinity in New Bila. Uh, thank you for being present with us. Today is Palm Sunday, and normally we have a big Palm Sunday with uh, the waving of palm fronds and children processing. Uh, we'll get to do that uh, celebration from your homes today. Uh, you'll also get the chance to share in communion during the worship service today. So uh, we're going to try that for the first time. So if you have something around the house that you might use as a symbol for the body of Christ, it could be a piece of bread or a Ritz cracker or a Waverly cracker, or you might even have a communion wafer handy. Any of those things that might, for you, represent the body of Christ, you might want to get that ready. Uh, you might also get something in a cup. Uh, this is what my grandkids call bug juice, but I think it's actually some kind of cranberry juice, and so that would work. Wine would work. Uh, anything that symbolizes the blood of Christ, you might have that ready as well. If that's a little weird for you, and you uh, just that, that just doesn't seem holy enough, use your imagination. God knows your heart, and so we'll have a time for us to share in communion together, even where from where you are. There are lots of concerns that we usually express during this time as we worship together. If you are a member of Trinity Church, you'll get an email about those concerns, or you can check the website and make sure that you're aware of all the things that are happening with the members of our congregation and keep them in your prayers. Now let's begin our worship with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of being able to worship in modern ways. We thank you for this time that we're able to spend together. And we pray that as we are to in worship together now, that you will open our hearts and our minds to your leading. Bless all that happens in this moment. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our first hymn is uh, probably an un it's not a traditional hymn, but it's called As the Mountains Surround Jerusalem. It's appropriate uh, for Palm Sunday. Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every bow, knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father.
Pray with me. Open the eyes of our hearts, O oh God. Speak to us as only you can. Give us the inspiration that we need. May the words of my mouth and the, and the uh, deliberations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight and make that possible by the work of your good spirit. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. There was a time, and I know it's hard for you to believe because I'm getting a gray hair already, but there was a time when my mother used to bounce me on her lap. And my grandmother would bounce me on her lap, and my aunts would all do the same. And very often, it was the same kind of uh, uh, nursery rhyme that they would do. They would bounce me and say, "This is the way the farmer rides. Uh, this is the way the uh, this is the way the gentleman rides with the galloper trot, galloper trot. And this is the way the the farmer rides. Hobbledy ho, hobbledy ho." I was amazed because my grandmother knew the same stuff, my aunts knew the same stuff. Oh, you the hobbledy ho, and you'd be hanging on for dear life. Uh, what I learned as I grew older is it wasn't just my family that knew that. Like, everybody seemed to know that. It was a nursery line that almost everybody knew. When I got a little older, I realized it wasn't just an American thing, that there were other versions, like the Polish version, which says, this is the way the farmer rides after dinner, after dinner. This is the way the girls ride with the prunes, with the prunes. And this is the way the peddlers ride, boom, boom, boom. Uh, Seems like with a, a whole bunch of different traditions, there's this nursery rhyme that keeps appearing. And the people who study these things have come up with some real interesting results that nursery rhymes uh, very often have their roots in some deep cultural aspects that are going on in our life. Uh, some of the, the most rigid patterns of our cultures get kind of reflected into the nursery and they're kind of held onto with stories and nursery rhymes. So it's not too uh, far-fetched to think that somewhere down the line that this equestrian etiquette, how you ride, reflected a way that you kind of judge somebody by the horse that they rode and the way that they rode it. And that's not too far-fetched because isn't it true that you can tell a lot about a person by uh, the car that they drive and the way that they drive it? So uh, this probably was a rigid pattern of equestrian uh, etiquette. Uh, the people you could identify as an individual or a group of people or a whole strata of the population by the way they handled their horses. I kind of use that as a background for what Zechariah uh, reflects upon. When he talked about Palm Sunday, you just heard from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians that talked about the Messiah, how he came as a servant and a lowly and a humble mistake. Zechariah wrote the same thing, and here's what he said. This is from the chapter, ninth chapter of Zechariah, the ninth verse. He said, Rejoice, rejoice, people of Zion. Shout for joy, you people of Jerusalem. Look for your king. He's coming to you. He is triumphant and victorious, but humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Uh, there's some good scholarly reasons to believe that that portion of uh, Zechariah was written at about the same time in history as Alexander the Great was making his way. This is about 333 B.C. Most of Zechariah was written around 500. They think that this portion of it was written right around the time that uh, Alexander the Great was making his uh, onset into world history. Alexander the Great was an incredible uh, part of the Macedonian Empire and his father, Philip, had established all that empire and he decided he wanted to extend it. And so he, at, at uh, Darius, he went up uh, against some of the, uh, the Persian Empire, which was included, was at the time considered to be insurmountable, and he sent them into defeat. And they started stumbling into retreat, a retreat that they never recovered from. And then he turned south and went on down uh, toward uh, Egypt. Egypt was his final goal, but the Phoenicians gave him some trouble along the way. But after a seven month siege of Tyre and Sidon, they fell, and uh, uh, he established an incredible empire. Uh, Jerusalem was a little bit off the beaten path, so uh, even though they, they weren't in the line of, of fire here, but they certainly knew about all the things that were going on. And uh, what most of 
them were. They were under Persian rule at the time, so most of them kind of considered this is a, this is a God thing. God's using Alexander the Great to uh, kind of set things free. Many people thought of Alexander the Great as maybe the Messiah. And so uh, Zechariah writes interesting words that says, look for your king. He's coming. And he is humble and riding on a donkey. Two interesting things you need to know about Alexander. Uh, one uh, is that he was an incredible horseman. He was able to uh, uh, tame some of the wildest horses. You may have heard of his horse, Bucephalus, which was completely untamable by everybody else. Uh, but he tamed Bucephalus and became a mighty, incredible, striding, plunging war horse. And he rode Bucephalus into battle. The other thing you need to know about him is he was incredibly brilliant. He was trained at the foot of Aristotle. Uh, he knew Greek culture backwards and forward, and in fact, he kind of thought that everybody ought to know and have this incredible Greek culture. So he considered it his job to spread it to everybody. That's, he wanted to force feed it to everybody because that's the way a uh, demagogue rides. Uh, so number one, you had he's an incredible horseman on this plunging war horse because that's the way the conqueror rides. And number two, you've got this guy who just says, we're going to, whether you like it or not, force feed this to you because that's the way a demagogue rides. And in contrast to that, this text from Zechariah says, that's all really good, but look for your king coming in a humble way, riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. Uh, that raises some questions about this whole thing. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, uh, everybody was going crazy. Uh, this, that's what we celebrate on Palm Sunday. We get out the palm branches and the, the robes and we lay them down on the feet so Jesus can march into Jerusalem and everybody was saying, this is the Messiah, this is the King. Uh, toward the end of the week, Almost everybody agreed. Well, this wasn't the king we expected or the king that we're looking for. And the whole thing looked like it was kind of a fizzle because this Messiah, this Jesus, was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And I guess that would have been the end of the story had not three days later a resurrection occurred. And then he who uh, judges men and nations by his righteous will somehow made it clear that Indeed, Jesus was justified. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one that we were looking for. And uh, the whole picture of, of history changes. Jesus was proclaimed master and Lord. The point of all that text is to remember that uh, we have to look for Jesus coming that way. Uh, not on a plunging war horse or not as somebody who says, you're going to take this whether you like it or not. But you have to realize this is a Messiah who comes in a lowly and humble way. That's, that's the way the real Messiah rides. And Jesus invites us then to, uh, to, a, to see a deeper picture of the way God really is and uh, be fed by that on our own free will. It's amazing that... Uh, we get to still see pictures of Jesus coming like that. I heard a sermon from a guy named Rudy Raber. He happened to be in a downtown church where I served while I was in seminary. So this is a number of years ago, but he preached on this topic and he said, uh, I had an occasion like that where I saw Jesus come in our midst. He said it was one of those hot afternoons and I was down here in downtown St. Louis and uh, at the corner of Grand and Lindell, uh, it's had to stop. I was on my business to do something great for the Lord and had to stop because stoplight came on. And I noticed off to the side some uh, really ugly looking, I mean, you know, beer belly and his hanging out and his shirt was torn and ragged. He hadn't shaved in a couple of days. And uh, so he was really tough looking. Uh, and I was kind of looking down my nose at him when I saw another person come into view. And it was a black lady who obviously was blind. She was pushing a white cane. And I thought, what? Well, you know, this is a tough-looking pair out here on the street. Uh, and then I saw the black lady lean over and whisper something in the man's ear, 
and he put out his arm, put out his papers, and she grabbed onto his arm, and he escorted her across the street. He said, no earl or duke in the world could have escorted a queen with many more pomp and circumstance than he did. It was just a royal feast to watch them across the road. He said, I was just touched by the whole thing. And he said, the windows were down because it was that hot afternoon. And he said, I, I thought I heard it sounded like the plop, plop, plop of a donkey. You know, he still comes that way. He comes right in the middle of all this coronavirus stuff that we're having. I had heard Pastor Darren, uh, a colleague of mine in Burton who preached last week, who said, happened to be an H-E-B this week. And uh, noticed there was a man trying to get a few supplies for himself. And he got into the counter and realized that he had not nearly enough money to pay for all the supplies that he had. He's, he said, oh, I, I'm sorry, ma'am, but I only have, uh, let me put this back, let me put this back, let me put this back. And he said, there were three people in line behind him, and they all waved at the waitress, and the lady waiting on him, and said, we'll take it. And so one by one, they went up and paid for the items and let the man get on his way with a full bag of groceries. I thought, isn't that cool? He comes to us that way. Um, Corey Ten Boom is famous because she spent time in Auschwitz. And because of that time that she spent there, uh, she wrote some powerful stories about forgiveness and learning to overcome all the difficulties that she had to face. Uh, what, when she was uh, safe back here and with people bragging and complimenting her about all the good things that she had written, uh, they decided to give her some honorary degrees and she was receiving awards all over the country for these writings of hers. And somebody asked her, they said, uh, is it hard to stay humble with all those awards and all this recognition you're getting? And she said a good thing. She said, uh, let me ask you, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, do you think the donkey for one minute said, this is about me? She said, if God is going to be praised, if God can use me and ride in on me, use me as the donkey in any way so that people can know his glory and his goodness, I'm happy to be the donkey, and I'll give God the glory and the praise. I like that. Um, I want you to look for him that way. I want you to look in the lovely ways that people are taking care of people. Uh, the things that people are doing. I had a lady talk to me last week. She said, you know, they're mailing checks out to people in the mail now. She said, I, I'm doing fine. I'm retired. I don't have any different needs. But she said, there are a lot of people who don't have work. I think I'm going to give mine to the local ministry so that they said somebody who really needs it can have it. I'm thinking, how else does that happen? That the master, plotting his way into our lives and touching our hearts. I believe that happens. I believe it happens occasionally in your life. And when you see it, give thanks. The master is with us. Um, There is a story about a lady who was uh, separated from her husband. Her husband had gone into the army, and he had uh, been gone for quite some time. When she got a letter from him, and she said, we are a long way from the United States, and we're off in an area that's really remote. And she said, he said, I thank God that I've got seven good friends here with me. I've gotten to know them really well, and they're really good friends. He said, I, I wouldn't be able to make it out here without them. And so uh, about within a month, his birthday occurred, and on his birthday, he got a big package from the United States that said, Happy Birthday. And when he opened it, there wasn't one gift in there. There were eight gifts in there for him and for his seven friends that were so dear to him. And he got tears in his eyes. He said, isn't that just like her? Isn't that just like my wife? She just does stuff, but that's just her nature. She does things like that. And that's what I want you to think about on this Palm Sunday is a, uh, a Christ, a Messiah, who rode into Jerusalem knowing full well what was going to happen, knowing full well that they were going to reject him and, and put him on a cross and he would be crucified. In fact, he prayed that, Father, could it be possible to take this from me? But not my will, but thine be done. Uh, isn't it 
just like God to do something like that. To, sit, to walk right into the middle of danger and defeat and death. And then uh, at the end of all of that, open his arms wide and let us celebrate and know that we're loved even despite our waywardness. Isn't that just like God to do that for us? So on this Palm Sunday, I want you to first of all recognize that uh, the Master is going to continue to come into our lives in lowly and humble ways and maybe occasionally through you. That would be glorious. And I want you to remember that uh, we can follow in the Master's footsteps in lowly and humble ways. And when we face danger that we think is just really undoing uh, things that are really frightening and hurtful to us, we can really believe that God does hold us in the palm of his hand. And somehow, somehow, maybe we can't understand it all, God will make all of this work for our good. Certainly, God did that with Christ. And because he loves us so much, he'll do that with us as well. That's the way the master rides. That's the way the master rides into our lives. And I pray that you will be blessed by that. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of a Messiah who comes to us in ways that we can't even comprehend. Thank you for the ways when we find ourselves following in his footsteps in lowly and unexpected ways to help the people around us. Lord, bless us with your presence. Make us see and hear and feel your coming in our midst even today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm going to sing to you a song you know well. It's uh, written by H.B. Spafford, who was uh, an incredibly wealthy businessman, but had everything go to pot. His business crashed. Uh, some of the stuff that he had, real estate properties that were lost. So he sent his family over to sea, overseas to England, and on the way over there, the ship was uh, had a wreck. And the people were in the water. Four of his daughters died. His only son that he had had died in a disease prior to that. Uh, and yet, H.P. Spafford got on a ship and went to meet his wife, was the only survivor now of the family. And as they got to the spot where his four daughters had died in the water, the captain notified him that we think this is the place. And he sat down in his cabin and wrote the words to, It is well with my soul. Sing along if you know the words. In peace, like a 
for you to share communion with us. And if you have some elements in front of you, please place that out in front of you right now. And uh, let's offer a, a blessing for those elements. Lord, you have broken, had your body broken and poured out for us. And we thank you for calling us again to this time of remembrance for how much that incredible act means to us. So we pray for your blessings upon these gifts of bread, whatever way we represent that, and these gifts of the cup, in whichever way we represent that. Touch these elements in front of us now with your own spirit so that they might reflect the body and the blood of Christ broken for us, poured out for us. In his name, amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave it to his disciples, and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Take the body of Christ. It's broken for you now. In the same way, also, he took the cup, saying, This cup is now the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you so that all your sins might be forgiven. Take and drink this, and do this in remembrance of me. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take this now. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken and poured out for us. Go forth from this time renewed and uplifted and rejoicing because of the power of Christ's Spirit which fills with you. Amen. One final song. It is Hosanna, loud Hosanna. This is a good Palm Sunday song. Son and the Holy Spirit.